Good evening. I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, how long can these extraordinary measures to stop the coronavirus last? We've heard anything from weeks to months. From travel bans to closures, is this the new reality? At issue on Ottawa's pandemic response. She said they were declining to test me. She never gave a reason. Why some sick people aren't getting tested for COVID-19 and those who are wait days for an answer. If I get corona, I get corona. They may have thought they weren't vulnerable, but young adults are ending up in hospital. Will the games go on? We're putting sport above health and humanity. Athletes speak out after they're told, find a way to keep training. This is The National. Canada's aggressive COVID-19 containment measures were intended to help keep the virus out, but for many, an effect has been to keep them stuck inside with their worry and stress. And while the Prime Minister tries to reassure Canadians, he is warning that this could go on for some time, weeks, even months. I know people are worried about what the days and weeks ahead hold, but there's no doubt these are uncertain times. So let's take you through the numbers. More than 870 cases across Canada now, with big jumps in four provinces. There are 40 new cases in BC, where an eighth person has also died. Alberta has 27 new cases and its first death. In Ontario, a second death and 44 new infections. And Quebec recorded 27 new cases. Across the country, at least 12 Canadians have now died. And as those numbers increase, so do questions and concerns about testing. We're hearing more and more from sick Canadians who say they're being told they can't get a test. Vicodopia looks into why that is. COVID-19 is surging in Spain, 11,000 cases. So when Lanny Selick returned from there with cold symptoms last week, she called her doctor's office right away. The doctor uh, triaged me over the phone and said, yes, I fit the protocol for testing. Then the retired CBC producer called this hospital to arrange for a test. She said they were declining to test me. She never gave a reason. With more and more people testing positive for COVID-19 in Canada, wait times for test results are getting longer. And the world supply of a chemical compound used in labs is running low. So in some places, that changes who qualifies for a test. CBC News has obtained a copy of new triaging criteria one Toronto hospital is now using. It advises against testing people who don't need urgent care or aren't pregnant. This ER doctor at another hospital in Toronto says certain health care and institutional workers will also get tested. These are groups that we would certainly want to test because we worry about the risk if they do have the infection. Reducing testing has risks. South Korea, Taiwan and Hubei province are credited with controlling their outbreaks with aggressive testing, not by rationing it. They've been testing uh, continuously, uh, including all contacts. And there's also they've also been starting to survey the general population to get a sense of um, the level of community spread. The scientist says it's time to call in research and university labs to help clear the backlog of tests in Canada. I think we're in emergency times and we should do this safely, but uh, expedite where we can. There are molecular and cellular biology labs around this country uh, who are itching to, to contribute to this effort. For people like Lanny Selleck who have moderate symptoms and can't get a test, health officials have the same advice. Stay home. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. A sense of security may be disappearing for people who thought their age would make COVID-19 a minor concern. Ontario's second fatality linked to the virus is a man in his 50s. And a report has raised concern by revealing just how many serious U.S. cases involve people even younger. Ellen Morrow looked into the real risks. <coughs> Canadian Carmen Lee enjoying the Spanish seaside earlier this month. The next week, the 23-year-old was at a Barcelona hospital, diagnosed with COVID-19. I had some discomfort breathing and um, speaking. I did have a high fever and I was really struggling with, with some of the lung, the lung issues. Lee, working as an au pair in Spain, isn't alone as a young person hit hard by the disease. A new U.S. report found that of the first 500 people hospitalized in that country with COVID-19, 38% of them were between 20 and 54 years old. 
Of those admitted to intensive care, 12 percent were between 20 and 44 years old. The numbers show the coronavirus isn't just dangerous for the elderly. Still, these spring breakers were breaking all the rules, choosing social lives over social distancing. If I get corona, I get corona. At the end of the day, I'm not going to let it stop me from partying. I'm worried for the older people, but not for me. Even though older adults are most at risk, the sobering statistics, this doctor says, means everyone needs to be concerned. Not only can this affect you and take your life, it could take the life of someone that you care about. Not only that, a surge in cases could overwhelm frontline doctors. This could happen very fast. We could reach or exceed capacity very quickly. What would you say to Lee has seen firsthand how sick capacity. the young can get. I have friends here who have been in more serious situations and they are young people. You're not invincible to this. Uh, any person at any age can develop pneumonia and it can be severe. Lee is now waiting for her symptoms to fully subside and life as much as possible to begin again. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. For more on this, let's turn once more to Dr. Isaac Bogosh, an infectious disease specialist. We've been relying on you for quite some time and we keep hearing, doctor, that older people or people with compromised immune systems are the ones at risk of getting seriously ill. But you listen to a story like that. Has that changed? Uh, not really. I mean, I think the data is still pretty strong that the older people are, the greater risk they have for having a more severe outcome and a more severe course of this infection. There's excellent data from Italy, from China, and now even emerging from the United States that if we look at the, you know, sadly, the ultimate outcome, life or death, uh, you know, it, uh, death is overwhelmingly uh, represented in people over the age of 60. Now, of course, people over the age of 60, if they get this infection, that doesn't mean they're going to succumb to this illness. It just means that they're significantly more likely to have uh, a more challenging course compared to younger individuals. So should this information, though, that, that we're hearing out of the United States, for example, change what our public health interventions or, or behavior should be? No, absolutely not. I think the same rules apply if you're 15, if you're 55, or if you're 105. We, we've heard about social distancing measures, and uh, these are extremely important. So people should avoid large gatherings. They should be working from home. They should just be spreading apart to really reduce uh, an individual's uh, likelihood of acquiring this infection and also to reduce transmission in the community. Okay, Dr. Bogosh, thanks again for helping us understand what's going on. Anytime. Now, all of these prevention efforts are certainly affecting Canadians' ability to earn a living. Some are already at the financial brink. But again today, the Prime Minister promised help is coming. The bottom line is this. We're giving you more help when you need it. If you're a parent, we're here for you. Just like for the single mom of two who will get nearly $1,500 by the end of May because of the increase in the Canada Child Benefit and the GST credit. If you're worried about making ends meet, we've got your back. That assistance will not be immediate, however. The government said the extra money will not start flowing for two to three weeks. And that's the tricky part. The measures Trudeau announced earlier this week do amount to tens of billions of dollars for support of support for businesses, workers and families. But Far Morales spoke to workers who fear it'll be too little too late. Hi. Welcome to Get Fit with Dave. Personal training has been Dave Shimkovich's life for 10 years. But these days, it's hard to put one foot in front of the other with business so dry. They don't want people to come into the home or they don't want to go out of the home. So it's been, uh, it's been hard to try to maintain the income that's coming in. The father of two has a wife, a mortgage and two young kids. He's self-employed and not eligible for EI and is now anxiously waiting for more details on the government's emergency support benefit for people like him. Everyday necessities like food, uh, utilities, stuff like that. So it's a little uneasy because I don't know when I'm going to be able to apply. Is there going to be a two-week waiting period or, you know, it's going to be a direct deposit, but how long is that going to take? Our goal is to get money in people's hands, people, especially people who don't have access to employment insurance, and, and to do that in, in, in two to three weeks. But even those with access to employment insurance worry it won't go far enough. EI provides you with about 50% of your wage, but as a server, um, your paycheck is about 50% of your earnings. 
So we will be getting about a quarter of our typical earnings. Sydney Cummings was recently laid off as a server at what is typically a bustling Toronto pub. The bulk of her earnings came from tips. Fears over the coronavirus had already been driving customers away for weeks, making it hard to save. My household is all servers and bartenders, so there's three of us that live there, and so we've all been laid off. And so we've been waiting and waiting to see if we'd be reached out to or talked to from our landlord, but none of us have had any information. And so we've also been in this awkward place of like, do we ask, do we wait? For the uncertainty and anxiety, there may be no relief in sight. Government officials have signaled that social distancing could continue for weeks, even months longer. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. As COVID-19 spreads, workers in Nova Scotia are facing a temporary shutdown at one of the province's major employers, Irving Shipbuilding. The company is laying off 1,100 employees. That's the bulk of its workforce for three weeks, citing absenteeism and trouble with suppliers. Irving has been working on federal contracts to supply naval ships worth billions of dollars. And CBC News has learned thousands of cabin crew working for Air Canada are expecting big layoffs. In a letter sent to staff, the airline says flights scheduled for April are down 80% from usual as demand drops and governments tell people not to travel. Air Canada Rouge won't be flying at all. More than 5,000 employees will temporarily be out of work. In Alberta, the economic shock is for some frightening. In a matter of days, the price of oil sands crude has simply collapsed. Carolyn Dunn has the reaction from a province feeling sudden pain that could rapidly spread to the rest of Canada. Filling up these days is like going back in time. Gas prices, the lowest they've been in more than a decade. That's, uh, it's crazy low right now. It's, it's insane. But don't expect consumers to celebrate, at least not in Alberta. I am rather worried about how the Calgary economy is going to go from, from here. I mean, everybody's suffering right now, so definitely, uh, yeah, it's going to take a toll. Just ask Bob Pelzer. He's cut staff hours at his gas station by two-thirds, and he's paying out of his own pocket to keep the doors open. Some of the fuel in our ground, we are losing over six cents a litre, so we're paying people to buy our fuel. There's a double whammy driving global oil prices down. Saudi Arabia and Russia are in a price war that's flooding the market with cheap oil, and the coronavirus is driving demand down, shockingly fast. Rush hour reduced to a trickle as people stay home from work and social activities. Uh, we have never experienced anything like this uh, in the history of our energy industry. When layered on top, of a massive global contraction in demand and layered on top of five years of economic and social fragility. Mr. Speaker, uh, we are facing a period of profound adversity. Former MP turned petroleum analyst Dan McTeague says only a price bounce back followed by a stable market will stave off economic calamity and not just in Alberta. Otherwise, there will be long-term implications for the Canadian economy. Uh, and I think uh, 2020 looks like it's going to be a year that will be a write-off as we continue to go into what appears to be a deeper and deeper recession. A steep price to pay for cheap gas. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. So COVID-19 is having a major impact. As each province and city steps up measures to manage the virus, Anita Bath is tracking stories from communities across Canada. Andrew, let's start in Ontario, where MPPs returned to Parliament to pass emergency legislation to give Ontarians relief through this pandemic. That includes helping to keep grocery stores and pharmacies fully stocked. Right now, municipal noise bylaws prevent them from accepting deliveries at certain hours. So we're going to bring temporary changes to allow them to accept deliveries. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Premier Doug Ford is reassuring that there is supply in place, so there is no need to panic buy. There is, however, concern about supplies in Ontario hospitals. A group of Toronto researchers is forecasting that the province will run out of ventilators and intensive care beds in just 37 days. 
They say this would still happen even if the current rate of COVID-19 is cut in half. Moving over to Quebec, the premier is asking people to stop moving around the province, avoiding all non-essential travel from one region to another. Right now, it's important to uh, say that uh, there's no uh, um, possibility short term to close a region. But we saw in other countries that it was successful to do so if you have many cases in a specific area. And the family of the first Quebecer to die from COVID-19 is pleading for people to listen to the warnings. Mariette Tremblay was living in a senior's home northeast of Montreal. The 82-year-old got the virus from a visitor who'd come from overseas. Her family says they hope her death will help save lives. Show good citizenship, social responsibility and stay home. We didn't have a chance to, say gra to save grandma, they say, but you have a chance to make a difference now. The family says everything must be done to prevent human tragedies like the one we are experiencing. Now, there are 127 new cases in Quebec for a total of 121. That's 27 new cases, rather, for a total of 121. All right, let's head back to Toronto. All right, thanks, Anita. There are dire warnings tonight in the United States about its ability to treat the coronavirus with fears and supplies about to run out. That comes as the number of reported coronavirus cases there climbs past 13,000. New York State has the most cases, more than 5,300. The jump is believed due to an increase in testing. And late tonight, an extraordinary step from the governor of California he is putting the entire state into lockdown, ordering all 40 million residents to stay home. As Paul Hunter tells us, it's part of increased action across the country to prevent the spread. Until today, the sight of spring break crowds ignoring social distancing now forced into it as authorities in Miami Beach today shut the beach altogether. In faraway New York, the hardest hit region in the country, new rules today for workplaces. Any still operating must now do so with just 25% staff at most. Medical supplies in New York City, meanwhile, may not last the month. And on the desperate need for more medical gear, the state's governor today implored Washington. This is a war. Treat it like a war. Say to the manufacturers in this country, I need you to build these pieces of equipment quickly. But on the many calls for more gear broadly, Donald Trump today suggested the onus should in fact be on state governments. First of all, governors are supposed to be doing a lot of this work, and they are doing a lot of this work. The federal government's not supposed to be out there buying vast amounts of items and then shipping. You know, we're not a shipping clerk. Trump did say millions of medical masks are now being produced, even though countless providers insist there still aren't nearly enough. The need so great, they're now being told to wear scarves or bandanas, if nothing else. Meanwhile, in Washington state, the dire need is for more hospital beds now. So they're building an ad hoc facility on a soccer field, while Trump considers an offer to use emptied cruise ships for hospital overflow. Some ships that would be ideally suited for what we're doing, and certainly they have a lot of rooms. They're big and they have a lot of rooms. Tonight, a sobering advisory from the U.S. State Department urging all Americans against traveling anywhere overseas. It's the highest possible warning. And to those already overseas, the message is equally blunt. Return home now. If not, the U.S. government may not be able to help. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Italy's reported death toll from this coronavirus has surpassed China's. Italy registered 427 deaths today, bringing their total to more than 3,400. China, by comparison, has reported more than 3,200 deaths. Italy does have a large elderly population. A cemetery northeast of Milan has been so overwhelmed, in fact, the military had to transport bodies to neighboring towns. Now, clearly a big focus of the pandemic response is people's physical health. But there is a profound impact on mental health, too. It's particularly around the anxieties around the unknown. Anxiety, fear, isolation. Up next, the calls for help 
and the overwhelming response. You have questions, we have answers. Our nightly medical panel is here. Hi, Nan. <laughs> Plus, Chris Glover and his Nan have advice for helping isolated seniors. We're back in two. Social distancing may help slow down the contagion, but it also breaks down social connection. And for those who already felt isolated or trapped, the response to COVID-19 presents its own risks. Here's Joanna Romiliotis on the mental health challenge and the people rising to meet it. It's the emptiness that can be overwhelming. For many, the pandemic is filling them with a mild sense of panic and a looming sense of dread. In the new reality of self-isolation and social distancing, even more are looking for help online. On the Big White Wall, an anonymous mental health forum, the number of anxious posts about the coronavirus are surging. Sort of anxieties about the shutdowns as well. Ian Tolman oversees the wall guides, the mental health practitioners who monitor the site. People are, uh, people are, are very concerned about their loved ones, etc. And that impacts on the day to day. And especially when there's a shutdown and people are not able to get out and about, it increases those anxieties. We met Cassandra Somer Flower in Ottawa last summer. It was soon after she started relying on the big white wall to help with her anxiety. She says it's even more of a lifeline now. So there's just a lot of stress, but I think, I think with the right supports, being with my family, using the big white wall community, and just generally like trying to stay positive, I think it's going to be okay. It's the unnerving truth. As more people are told to stay away from each other, more need each other too. On Kids Help Phone, the calls and texts from anxious young people and adults are pouring in. We're also really worried about with isolation comes the potential for increased domestic violence. Everyone's in a state of uh, worry and angst and anxiety, increased uh, abuse increased bullying or, or cyberbullying, those kinds of behaviors come out in heightened emotionally charged times. It is alarming and yet what is gaining traction here too, the willingness to offer a hand. When the line called out for help, more than 800 people volunteered. And online, more resources are added daily, guides offering strategies on how to cope and how to talk about the fear of the unknown. Oh my God, that's so cute. Then there's this, an emerging alternative to the real thing. Teresa Smith organized a virtual wine and cheese with friends. We agreed that while we need to stay away from each other, we still need to create social connection. Cheers! It's a toast to the need to connect, now more than ever. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. What a great idea. Another group particularly susceptible to loneliness and isolation right now is seniors. But as Chris Glover explains, there are ways you can help while keeping a safe distance. 92% of Canada's seniors live independently at home. They're also at most risk in this pandemic. So staying away from your elderly loved ones is the best defense. But that isolation comes with consequences. Keeping seniors engaged is on all of us now more than ever. Music is a great way to ease stress. Try making a playlist on an old device with some of the greats like Sinatra and Billie Holiday. Keeping their minds stimulated is key, but anything you drop off for a senior must be cleaned. Wipe down those books, puzzles, DVDs, and put them in a Ziploc bag. They get some new entertainment, and you keep your germs to yourself. Get the kids involved sending artwork. The senior in your life will enjoy it for days, plus it'll occupy the little ones. Added bonus. COVID-19 is catapulting many seniors, including my own Nan, into the digital age. Hi, Nan. Why can't I see you? Can you see me? Oh, there you are. What are you doing today? I was just given a list of 12 people to call from the church to see if they're fine. Do things together, but separately. Watch a favorite show or share some tea. Hey, Nan, what kind of tea are you having? I am having Earl Grey tea today. Oh, I'm having lemon and ginger. Oh, I love lemon and ginger. 
staying active is hard, all cooped up. Even doing laps around the home helps. But avoiding stairs is important if mobility or balance is an issue. But stretching can help people feel nimble. And for those missing the greens, they can grab a putter, ball, and cup. All you need is a bit of space. Even if it's a miss, with a little creativity around the home, we'll all get through this together. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. When it comes to social distancing, how close is too close? We look at the confusion about the recommendations, but first, Rosie is here with that issue. That's right, with the number of COVID-19 cases in Canada on the rise, the political response has also been escalating. Closing borders, billions in financial support, and calls for Canadians to stay home. How is the government managing in this unprecedented time? Chantal and Andrew will join me after the break. We're working to slow the spread of this virus. We're taking steps to support you through tough times. There is nothing we won't do to keep you safe and to protect your health. The Prime Minister addressed Canadians for the fourth day in a row, calling again on people to stay home and try to reassure them that the government will be there to help. But in these extraordinary times, do we need to see more extraordinary measures? How is Ottawa managing the crisis so far? It's Thursday, and I'm here with At Issue, but we are doing our part with social distancing. Chantal Hébert is still in Montreal, but not in the studio. Andrew Coyne is still in Toronto, but again, not in the studio. Thank you both. I appreciate you doing that. Um, Obviously, things have changed pretty uh, quickly and dramatically since, since we last talked, and the government has ramped up its response, both in terms of a public health response and an economic response. Andrew, maybe I'll just start with you in terms of your assessment of how the government is, is managing this. Well, you could say they're late with this, and you would be, they would be in company with virtually every other government on Earth. Everybody's been disarmed by how rapidly this thing has grown. I think everybody was a little bit behind the curve, maybe with some exceptions in the public health community. Uh, but short of them, I, it's hard to criticize, because I certainly wasn't, uh, didn't see as the, the necessity for as much as they're now uh, finding they're having to do, as you say, both on the public health front and on the economic front, and, of course, in terms of closing the border. These are extraordinary measures that they are improvising on the fly in the space of a few days. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, I, think, I think you would now say they have more or less caught up with the gravity of the situation. Uh, Chantal, I'll get you to weigh in on, on how you think the government is doing. I think uh, on a number of fronts, uh, the government has done the best it could and uh, what any other government would have tried to do, to close the border by common assent uh, with a partner who is at best unpredictable, like Donald Trump, has to be a plus, and it's being done in as orderly a manner as one can imagine. This is the longest border in the world uh, and it, between two countries that are intertwined in so many ways. Uh, federal, provincial, it's been a strength of this government that it has managed to build coalitions uh, when dealing with big issues. Mm -hmm. Think of uh, renegotiating NAFTA that cross party lines. And by and large, uh, the federal government and the premiers, although they usually don't agree on a lot of things, are speaking with one voice. And as far as I can tell, so are uh, the opposition parties in the House of Commons, but also in the provinces. So I, there are no miracle cures to this, and there are no easy answers. But I think most Canadians would take comfort from the fact that the, their political class has found a way to speak more or less with one voice. Andrew, can I get you to weigh in on the border there? I, mean, I was told yesterday that it took sort of from start to finish, although they, they still had details and are still working on details now, about 22 hours to get the, the Americans on board with this idea. I mean, Chantal's right. That's fairly extraordinary when you consider who we are dealing with. Closing the border on its own, of course, was never going to be the solution that some people thought it was. It was only ever going to be a contributor cause, because just you're controlling, as we now know, uh, the rate of transmission within our borders, then simply closing to outdoor, outsiders was not going to help at all. Mm -hmm. um, and all of these measures, to some extent, depend on public opinion also moving. Uh, I don't think you have enacted, even though it would like us, it would like government to have done things much sooner, you've got to take have one eye on what the public opinion would be ready to 
to extend the kind of draconian measures that we're yeah. now all subjected to, including the, the way we're broadcasting this show, uh, I don't think it would have been able to get the constituency for it two weeks ago. That, that's a good point. That you have to build up sort of that, that ability to do that within the population. Just a last point to both of you on the, the prime minister, you know, making it a point to come out every day. Today, he didn't even have, you know, a, a particular message. It was really to repeat messages to make sure people understood things. And I guess uh, to reassure people, how, how do you think he's uh, doing, Chantal? I think it's important that he does that. It would be important that he had a clear message every day and not just cheerleading. And I think the template for showing up every day, which is easier to um, implement at the provincial level because you have many more things you can talk about this being set here in Quebec uh, by uh, François Legault, who's been doing it very successfully. But don't forget, this template in this province comes from the ice storm and Lucien Bouchard's way of showing up every day with practical details. I think it's harder for the federal government to have a new practical message every yeah. day. So mm, the prime minister is going to have to be careful not just to uh, have people come out and sound like he's got nothing to say. Andrew. This really challenges all political leaders. You certainly have to smarten up in a hurry and put traditional politics aside. People are badly frightened by this, and they're looking, as they do in time of crisis, to people in positions of leadership to reassure them, to show them the way forward. It's a shame that I think Trudeau, by the time of this crisis, was a diminished figure in Canadian politics, didn't have the kind of stature he would have had two, three years ago. Uh, but perhaps we'll see that the, his performance in the crisis may lead people to rally around him. There's a, traditionally, people do tend to rally around leaders mm -hmm. uh, in times like this, and we'll see whether that happens here. Okay. Well, I'm just reassured that I get to see you on Thursdays. That that helps me get through that things are sort of normal still. Uh, thank you both. Before we go, be sure to subscribe to At Issue, the podcast for extra content. This week, we're going to continue talking about really the only story out there. But in this case, the role of the opposition parties in the time of a pandemic. Look for it on any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. But for now, it's back to Adrian and Andrew in Toronto. And when we come back, when I wash my hands, should I use warm or cold water? The doctors are on standby to take this and more of your questions after the break. Welcome back. That time of the program where we take your coronavirus questions and put them directly to a team of doctors tonight. We've got Dr. Isaac Bogosh, infectious disease specialist at the University Health Network in Toronto, and Dr. Taslim Nimji, an emergency physician at Humber River Hospital. Good evening to the both of you. Dr. Bogosh, question number one. When I wash my hands, should I use warm or cold water? You know, at a very practical level, it doesn't matter. As long as you're washing your hands with soap and water, uh, that's all that matters. And also, you know, if there's no soap and water available, alcohol hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol is also just sufficient as well. But does temperature matter? Because we have actually gotten questions where people have asked, okay, if I have mail or my newspaper, is there a way to, to disinfect that? I don't know, by, by sticking to the, the freezer or something. You know, in all fairness, we know the virus can stick to different surfaces for different amounts of time. And a lot of it does depend on the temperature and the environment around it. It can stick to surfaces for about two hours to two days, depending on the surface and the uh, surrounding temperature. So the key message is, you know, if you are touching some high contact surfaces, just wash your hands afterward. Dr. Nimji, next question for you. My apartment complex has shared laundry facilities. Is that risky? And I'm thinking both on the outside of the machine and on the inside. So as long as you're using regular laundry detergent or soap uh, and a regular rinse cycle, you're fine in terms of the laundry portion itself. And then when it comes to uh, being in the laundry room, which is a shared facility, practice your social distancing, keep your two meters distance, make sure you are washing your hands either with soap and water before and after or with the uh, alcohol disinfectant. We, we also got a question about uh, air conditioning in apartment units and whether there's any risk of the virus being transmitted that way. Uh, for this particular virus, we don't have any data that suggests that that would be the case. So I don't think that you would need to sort of uh, change the way you're using your heater or your air conditioner in your living facility. Okay. Dr. Bogosh, should I get the pneumonia vaccine since COVID-19 can cause pneumonia? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an excellent idea for people who are eligible to get this vaccine or who are recommended to get the vaccine to absolutely get the vaccine. If that's part of 
uh, someone's routine vaccine schedule, 100 percent, it's a great idea to get this vaccine because ultimately we know that we don't have a vaccine yet for this infection. We don't have a targeted antiviral drug for this infection. And people should be in optimal health in case they get this infection. They'll have a much better chance of uh, fighting it off. Dr. Nimji, next question for you. How long does it take to recover from COVID-19? So it depends, again, on your state of health before you get COVID-19 and then how badly it impacts you. So if you're an otherwise sort of young, healthy person uh, for your average healthy adult, probably about a week, maybe, you know, a little bit longer, but not much longer, similar to if you had the flu. Uh, and then for, certainly for those people that are sicker and requiring hospitalization, then that would move into weeks. And at the real sort of end of the spectrum for people that are needing um, ICU, and that's for the complication that we call ARDS or acute respiratory disease stress syndrome, then you're talking multiple weeks. And if and when you do recover, I mean, how, how soon before you can see other people? Yeah, so there were some studies that were out there on like whether or not people were having positives or negatives if they were re-swabbing, and these were really qualitative tests that they were using, so not ideal. Um, once you recover, there's no reason why we think you can get an infection again. And then once you're asymptomatic, really people are saying between 48 to 72 hours of being asymptomatic following that infection, and then you're okay to start sort of seeing other people again and not being worried about infecting them. All right. Dr. Nimji, Dr. Bogosh, that's all the time we have for questions. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, as we mentioned, we will be asking your questions about COVID-19 every night. So send us the questions you have. You can message us directly on Instagram at CBC The National, or you can send us an email at thenational at cbc.ca. We know the pandemic has put a lot of people on edge, and some are lashing out at strangers for public behavior they think puts others at risk. Tina Lovegreen looked for the line between valid concern and needless shaming. On the first day of spring, the White Rock Pier is bustling. You wouldn't even know that there is a pandemic, and there is very little room to keep your distance. Especially in this lineup outside of a cannabis dispensary. They're just standing like sheep, and they're not thinking about anybody but themselves. Everybody's got to come together in this. Patricia Rogers has a front row seat to it all. She says she's doing her part by staying inside, but as for others, people are not taking the whole virus seriously enough. They absolutely are not. Some have gone online to criticize other people's behavior. One person tweets, chaos happening along White Rock Beach. Restaurants packed, huge lines, nobody social distancing. It's scary and heartbreaking. Another, curving the curve, I guess. One problem is continued confusion. Can you go outside like Vancouverites are? And what can you do there? In true West Coast fashion, many are keeping up with their fitness as gyms have shut down. I'm certainly practicing social distancing, yeah? Yeah. So you're six feet away, you're fine. I go touch it. I'm pretty good. I lean back a little bit. We hung out yesterday and went to the park and just had blankets that were like four Stop feet it. away from each other. <laughs> this is not optional, and I want to be very clear. BC's provincial health officer says you can go outside, just leave two meters between you and others. You can walk your pet, you can go for a bike ride, you can play with your kids. And these are the things that you want to do in a small group, as a family, together. But if you have symptoms or returning from travel, it's a different story. You shouldn't even be going to the grocery store. But it's possible to keep your distance and still connect, says the psychologist. We can still interact with one another virtually, digitally, right? Like we are right now. Just don't come too close to each other in person. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Coming up, the debate over the upcoming Olympics rages on and athletes are speaking out. But first, the challenge of staying home for days on end has led to a lot of creativity. Are you ready for a cabinet meeting? Huh? Say, for example, your long-awaited tickets to the hit musical Hamilton were refunded. Well, do like these guys. Put on your own show. Because we got it made in the shade. Find yourself staring out of a window for hours on end. Grab a sock puppet and make it a game. But remember, always jump in moderation. Can't go out dancing. How about holding your own elaborately choreographed rave? But our absolute favorite fix has to be this solution to shuttered gyms everywhere. If you don't have a treadmill at home, try a little soap, a little water, a lot of balance, 
and you're off to the races. <laughs>
they should have them. They were delivered with a smile and received with a big smile as well. <laughs> and so clearly, I, you know, they have a supply of masks because of people who do woodworking, right? And so exposure to sawdust and all that sort of thing. But their generosity has apparently triggered a whole other wave of generosity with other companies having heard about what they've done and then wanting to do the same. Totally. Well, it's, this is a really tough time, right? Every, everybody gets that. But I promise you, every day that we see terrible things happening, we see, a, you know, a barrage of these wonderful moments. Yeah. And uh, that's Canada, and we're going to keep watching all of that. That is a national for March 19th. Good night. Good night.